so Shiva is uh, um, uh, his undergraduate degree is in physics from India, and then his PhD he did at Rockefeller University in 1990, 1995 to 1999. Then he was a postdoc at uh, NEC Research Institute in Princeton, 1999 to 2000. And he has many, many uh, appointments after that. But now he's the deputy director at Mechanobiology Institute and head of the department, IFOM and National University of Singapore Joint Research Laboratory and National University of Singapore. Oh, he has many other things, but it's my great. Uh, I met Shiva like a few years ago at a uh, meeting in Germany about 4D nucleon. So he's, I'm, I'm really fascinated with his work on uh, nucleus and the geometry of the nucleus, how he can uh, perturb the geometry and change the function of the nucleus. So I'm, again, uh, welcome to, to Michigan. Thank you. Yeah, you can keep that one. Okay, while it gets started, let's, uh, let me thank Indika for having me here. It's been a great day uh, as and when it starts. I never came to Michigan, so this is one excuse for me to come to Michigan. Uh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I was actually worried that uh, the flight, I missed the flight yesterday because there were many flights delayed from LA coming to Michigan. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, I hope I'm not in the wrong place, uh, because I'm an experimentalist, uh, I'm a biologist, thinking about the nucleus. But what I can actually show you as we go on is that somehow this uh, thinking about it uh, links up to a lot of uh, bioinformatics, a lot of computational biology, a lot of information theory, and so on and so forth. So my lab looks at uh, how the nucleus is organized the mechanical environment of the nucleus and how maybe that could be precursor for reprogramming the genome. As Indica said, I'm at the Mechanobiology Institute. It's a new institute that we have set up and I'm also part of this uh, cancer foundation. So one of the reasons why we got interested in this was to revisit a question that all of us are very familiar with, uh, which is that if you look at the cells in your body, uh, their stiffness is very different depending on which tissue you look at. Uh, if you're in a brain tissue, it's a very soft tissue, whereas muscle tissues are much more stiffer, and the bone tissue is uh, the stiffest in the, in the body. So as cells, some stem cells, as you start differentiating, cells have to adapt to this extracellular matrix environment, not only adapt, but they need to sculpt it. They need to create that extracellular matrix so that they actually form the tissue architecture. And for a long time, one had forgotten that uh, the stiffness of tissues matter. But what I'm going to show you is that it matters the, the, for every, every regulatory step that cells have to, cells have to carry out. Uh, so for example, in diseases, the stiffness of these cells change dramatically. So this was realized long time ago. Uh, in fact, these are drawings from Cajal almost a century ago that one realized that when he looked at uh, many tissues, uh, individual cells in a tissue would lose contact such as this, which means that they change the geometry of these, uh, of their respective cell type and they transdifferentiated. Either they went into apoptosis or they transdifferentiated into some other cell. And one had for a long time wondered how does cell geometry in a tissue get maintained and how does changes in this geometric constraint alter the phenotype of that cellular uh, state. So we wondered that perhaps thinking about it, uh, if I want to transition cells into different uh, epigenetic states, uh, it must require both this matrix and soluble biochemical signal that cells see, and that as a consequence will lead to very uh, precise genome regulatory programs. But then uh, you have this nucleus as one of the biggest organelles there that's actually organizing the genome as a central regulator of linking this matrix to genomes. And that's the thing that we got interested that perhaps there is a language there that one needs to understand. Uh, the language I'm going to talk about 
is the fact that, as all of you know, uh, cells have multidimensional biochemical circuits uh, to regulate genomes. And cells are actually, as I said, very mechanical. Uh, they, they really have a physical architecture. There is a cytoskeleton, there is a nucleus, and the cells stick to the, either the matrix or the extracellular uh, neighboring cell. So we wondered that the connection between these two spaces, one is a mechanical space, which is a physical space, and one is an information space, which is a regulatory space. Uh, we wondered that perhaps there are modular codes in organizing the genome that is connecting these two spaces. Uh, and that's a question that we're actually interested in. And how does uh, long genomes which are polymer threads pack into the nucleus uh, through a number of proteins, histones and non-histone proteins, with a number of constraints, physical and chemical constraints, and kept in a spatio-temporal manner, in a dynamic manner, so that cells uh, can access different regulatory sites? And are there really modular codes in thinking about it? So when you think about this, nucleus, for a long time, uh, for the last 10, 20 years, one knows that uh, through a number of spectral karyotyping methods of uh, developing techniques to paint chromosomes, you know that uh, genomes are non-randomly organized. There is some arrangement pattern. Uh, the specific chromosomes occupy specific location, uh, and in a tissue-specific manner, uh, if one looks at uh, brain tissue versus muscle tissue versus bone tissue, the arrangement seems to be uh, different uh, in the way chromosomes are packed. And more re recently, uh, through a number of these uh, chromosome capture techniques, you know a lot of uh, information about how specific contacts are set up between the genomic organizations. So the question is, the nucleus is a mechanical container. When cells change their shapes or have very precise shapes, the mechanical container or the mechanical nucleus is very different uh, in these different tissue models, so thereby facilitating different genomic contacts. That's our argument. So one can actually do, uh, try and analyze this in two ways. One is, one is to go back to tissues of different types and test it, or we took a slightly, uh, uh, you know, we took a step back and, and decided that we take advantage of microfabrication techniques uh, where we can sculpt the geometry of cells. Uh, these are techniques that have been around in the field for some time. Uh, the premise of this technique is that you take a ligand of interest and print them onto your slides in shapes that you want them to be, where the ligands have to be, and then stick your cells there. And the cells will then take very specific shapes. Uh, so this way, you can actually tune the shape of a cell very precisely, understand what might be the course, and then go back to the tissue to see what this language uh, maintains. So we worked with uh, fibroblasts. We worked with these uh, polarized cells. But you could work with any cell type. And what I'm going to talk today is a very generic principle. So these cells, these cells are part of the connective tissue. They're usually polarized, elongated cells. Uh, we decided that we take the cells and change its aspect ratio or the shape or the size and ask how does the genome respond. Uh, see, there's some patterns in, in, in regulation that are built in these cells. So what I'm going to do today is to show you that uh, changes in cell shape uh, alters accessibility to chromatin uh, and alters the nuclear mechanical state as we change shapes of cells. And I'll show you that there is a nice uh, mechanical coding of how chromosomes reorganize as you change shapes of cells to facilitate a precise transcriptional output. And then I'll show you that from our understanding of this, we can now precisely change shapes of cells. And we have found co conditions where when you change the shapes of cells in a, precise, in a particular manner, you can actually start thinking of cellular reprogramming. So I'll, I'll, I think the implications are actually very important, and so I'll, I'll sort of touch upon those towards the end. So let me walk you through some slides. This is going to be an external talk, but it's really theoretical uh, uh, driven in many cases. 
So when you take these cells, these are polarized cells. What you have in these polarized cells are very long actin fibers. Uh, green color is the actin fibers, and the blue color is the nucleus. And these actin fibers go beneath the nucleus and above the nucleus and press these nucleus into a flat ellipsoid. Uh, that's what these uh, these fibers do for these cells. Now, as you change the shape of the same cell, all I'm doing is taking it from a more elongated shape to a more squarish looking shape. You completely remodel this actin uh, biochemically so that this actin, which is in a stressed fiber form, becomes completely relaxed, very punctated, and that results in modulating the nuclear shape, size, and volume. The nucleus, which is very flattened uh, because of these fibers, now it changes in shape, the nucleus bulges out. So you can already see that if I have a nucleus which is flat and the chromatin is organized and I change the shape of the nucleus, I can already form new contacts within the nucleus for the way I organize chromosomes. So as a consequence of this, what you find is that the dynamic states of the nucleus alter is the same nucleus you do a time lapse imaging of this container which is a nucleus which is very stable and now you alter the shape of the nucleus or remodel the actin fibers by pharmacological inhibitors the nucleus becomes highly dynamic and plastic as you notice here it's the same it's the same cell uh, so I, we can actually take back these cells and plate it back uh, and they they become completely stiff like this so it's a very nice transition that cells, based on the shape, uh, can actually regulate the dynamic nature of the nuclear nuclear container. And these are typical chymograph for that. And this is a typical readout of the nuclear area. If you plot the area, projected area as a function of time, it's uh, not fluctuating that much, very stable. The moment you reorganize the actin structure, uh, you large fluctuations in the nuclear uh, nuclear area and then if you inhibit some of the motors that drive this uh, forces from the cytoskeleton such as the myosin motors you completely stabilize stabilize this nucleus suggesting that there's a cytoskeletal actomyosin basis for controlling the nuclear dynamics so we can actually push this further and look at internal parts of the chromatin uh, if you look at internal parts such as the heterochromatin structure, uh, these are all very stable and the cells are stably attached. And when the cells are relaxed, every part of the chromatin starts to become very dynamic. So you can actually build these kind of correlation matrix. Basically what they are is, if different parts of the chromatin is moving around together, the question is do they move in, co in, in a coordinated manner or in an uncorrelated manner? And when the cells are attached very well, most of the chromatin structure, different parts of the chromatin move together in a correlated manner, suggesting that there's a dynamic fingerprint in the way you organize chromatin. And the moment you relax the cell or the cytoskeletal tension, most of them get uh, decorrelated, so that different parts of the genome now is accessible. And we have a large program thinking about the telomeres, and I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, I'll just play this movie. And what you will see is that uh, different parts of the, uh, every little dot is a telomere, which is the end of the chromosome. Uh, we can analyze every part of it in, in live cell imaging and track them and track the dynamics as the cell relaxes or as the cell stabilizes. And there's a, there's a large chain that you see in different uh, parts of the telomeres that as you relax these cells, into different shapes, their dynamics uh, is altered quite a bit. Not only the telomeres, we can now, using a number of imaging methods, uh, this is a direct map of chromatin structure in living cells, uh, where we use uh, the histone that packed the genome, and we label the histones and use polarization imaging. Uh, basically, the histones are tightly bound, they will rotate less. If they're loosely bound, they'll tumble more. And you can build microscopic live cell images of such uh, nuclei. And what you find is that when the, when the cells are attached well, 
most parts of the chromatin in fact is stably uh, stably compacted but as the cells detach they become highly fluidic uh, different parts become highly fluidic and you can plot what is called a spatial density correlation function uh, measuring the length scale over which they are coupled with each other uh, within the nucleus and uh, as a consequence of this what you find is that uh, that the matrix contact Mm. If I play this movie once more, this is a live cell uh, movie of the changes in the chromatin compaction state. And what you find is that uh, there is an elaborate, uh, what we now found is uh, this elaborate actomyosin forming link, this a proteinaceous link within the cytoplasm that regulates how the nuclear shape and dynamics is set up in, in living cells and how the cells attach to the neighboring cell or the matrix dictates how internal parts of the chromatin is actually kept uh, either in a loose or a, or a compacted manner. This paper, yeah. No, formin is not the point. I'll come to that actually. Mm -hmm. Is the red the heterochromatin and the blue the euchromatin, yeah. Yeah, because the, what the what this polarization imaging that we have set up is more condensed parts, which is the more heterochromatic structure, mm -hmm. are warmer in colors because the proteins tumble less there, and in euchromatin regions they tumble more. So the imaging goes uh, this method to directly visualize chromatin compaction state. Yeah, and so based on this, uh, uh, as you rightly asked, there must be proteinaceous links connecting up to the up to the nucleus. Uh, there's a number of molecules now identified in the literature, and we, I'll show you our work. The idea is that from the cytoskeletal filaments such as actin and microtubules and intermediate filaments that exist in the cytoplasm, there are bridges that connect through the nuclear membrane to the chromatin. And we ran a RNAi screen, basically a screen to delete different proteins, and ask which protein, when you delete, alters the shape and size of the nucleus and the dynamics of chromatin. And so we are now a number of interesting molecules that connect from the site of cellular attachment to the matrix uh, to the point where chromatin is actually anchored. And I'm not going to go into the details of these uh, proteins. Suffice it to say that these are techniques of uh, asking are the histones tightly bound to the DNA or loosely bound you do a fluorescence recovery after photobleaching experiments. In control cells, these histones are tightly bound. When you bleed, they don't recover back. But when you genetically ablate many of these links from the extracellular matrix to the nuclear membrane, the core histones uh, are dynamically turning over on the chromatin. Uh, we have now recently shown that not only the core histones, but even the DNA repair proteins, a number of nuclear proteins, are very sensitive to how mechanical constraints of cells uh, are set up in tissue context. So what I've told you so far is uh, the cells are mechanical architectures and the nucleus is held by all these links. I didn't go into the details of it. And suggesting that the nucleus in living cells are held under tension. I mean, that's a major take home point. Uh, and when you relax the tension by cell geometry constraints, the nuclear gets relaxed, becomes highly dynamic. The question is, does this got to do with uh, anything to do with genome regulation? So what we decided to do was uh, take transcriptome of each shape is the same cell. All we have done is change the shape of the cell by this microfabricated pattern and take the transcriptome map. And what you find is that there is a nice map between linking shapes, geometry, and linking the information space of cells. What you find is that certain shapes are more sensitive, they are more differentially regulated genes in certain shapes. Uh, and so from these maps, we can figure out now uh, what dictates, what are the type of uh, geometric constraints that dictate genomic programs. So let me walk you through one example. We've been analyzing this quite a bit because we want to link it back to tissue because, uh, as I said in the beginning, bodies like ours, we only have about 200 cell types. And every cell in the body has a very specific shape. 
changes in shape takes you to the epigenetic landscape. Okay. And let me walk you through a polarized cell which we're using, the anisotropic cell. And what you found was a very interesting modular design. If you take these cells which are polarized and look at the transcriptome, what they express is mostly cell matrix genes. And so those matrix genes are actually necessary for the cell to reinforce this attachment. Uh, and they use serum response pathway uh, to, to target, uh, to express those genes. But when the same cell is made into isotropic shape like this, what you already notice is that the actin organization is changed. And if you look at the transcriptome, they switch the transcriptome from a cell matrix genetic program to a cell cycle program. So as the cells are actually turning on all the cell cycle genes uh, in the same cell, but what you've done is change the shape of the cell, right? So uh, now uh, we can actually quantify that better <coughs> to show that indeed these specific pathways are, are important. So you take a polarized cell and do a single cell mechanics experiment, as I said, to turn on these genes, you need the serum response pathway. And one of the transcription core factor for this pathway is cytosolic, and then it's transduced to the nucleus to turn on these genes. It's interesting that if we did a single cell experiment, you take a cell uh, and stretch it somehow and label the transcription core factor, what should happen is that this transcription signal should go to the nucleus upon stretching. And so what I, when I play this movie, there's a transcription cofactor that's a cytosolic. And the moment we stretch it, what you will find is that the transcription cofactor goes to the nucleus. Uh, so this is one major way that cells regulate transcription factors uh, for gene activation. And we are showing that there's a mechanical origin in regulating many of the transcription factors that we know of today. Uh, we now have very quantitative models uh, combining how mechanics couples with uh, uh, biochemistry in order to release transcription factors to the nucleus. And I'm happy to discuss it later if anybody's interested in it. So what all of this suggested is that uh, changes in shapes of cells regulate a number of transcription factors and cofactors to turn on respective groups of genes. Uh, as all of you know, these genes are harbored on different chromosomes uh, and said that uh, when the transcription factors are transduced to the nucleus, you have a co-regulation of those genes. So which means that if you're changing the shape of the cell and changing the shape of the nucleus, uh, there must be a mechanical code driving the regulatory programs because what we're seeing is a very precise cell matrix transcription program to a cell cycle transcription program when you change shapes. Uh, so our hypothesis was that there's a contact map that's optimized in a cell for a given cell type. And these contact maps are, are co-clustering of genes and co-clustering of chromosomes at specific locations that harbor the target genes of, the, of these specific pathways when the cell geometry is optimized. When the cell geometry is altered, you go into a new contact map uh, new configuration of chromosome arrangements such that you then regulate a completely new transcription program. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So these are single cell experiments now. You know, there are many cells in the body, with connective tissue cells, for example, are isolated cells, they deposit extracellular matrix and connect to the matrix, and the matrix links up to neighboring cells. But I'll come back to single cells, uh, cell cell contact as we've seen. Yeah? Uh, so the reason for this argument is that uh, recently we had proposed that uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of works that if you look at the chromosome positions in the nucleus uh, and look at the centroid positions of each chromosome and build a physical distance matrix, uh, basically the distances between uh, individual chromosomes and build it as a matrix here, interphysical distances, interchromosome physical distances. What we found was that certain chromosomes have similar distances between them, and certain chromosomes have 
different distances. And then we took the transcriptome of that, those cell types, and surprisingly to us, the chromosomes that are close by with similar distances had similar activity distances. Uh, that means that the activity distance is computed by taking the transcriptome and asking which chromosomes is more active and which chromosomes are less active from the transcriptional perspective and take the interchromosome activity distance. And we, what, what we found was a very nice correlation that co-regulated co chromosomes are usually co-clustered within the nucleus. And we then looked at all the transcription factor networks that are annotated. And from the transcriptome map, we could assign for each of these transcription factors, where are the target genes on which chromosomes are they active? And so this is an activity map of the target genes of specific transcription factor network. And what you have is a map for a given cell type. This map, you can make it for cell, different cell type because you know the transcriptome of those cell types. And you can uh, annotate which chromosomes harbor the genes of those pathways. And what we found was a very nice uh, correlation that most of the co-clustering of the chromosome that happen are optimized for the transcription factor network topology that exists for the cell type. That means that the target genes of these transcription factors uh, were all in the neighborhood, whenever that comes, neighborhood of those chromosomes. So suggesting that there's an optimal uh, connection between physical space of arranging chromosomes to the network topology of, of the cell. If this is true, then we can actually start uh, thinking about how cell shapes might be reorganizing this optimization uh, that exists. So as I said, when, I, when we change cell shape, what happens is that you change the nuclear morphology. Nuclear that was flattened uh, became much more uh, bulged out. And so we, have a, we make a map of all chromosomes where they go around. Uh, when you change shapes of cells. And we, what, we, what we found was a very nice uh, orientation of the chromosomes uh, with respect to the mechanical axis of cells. So if you looked at uh, individual chromosomes and plot along the mechanical axis what angles they make, what we found was that when the cells are very stretched, chromosomes align with the stretching axis, uh, specific chromosomes. And when the, when the cell nucleus is altered into a cell shape is altered into a new shape and a new mechanical axis for the nucleus, then all the chromosomes that are aligned in the X axis began to align along the Z axis of new mechanical axis of cells. So this is the distribution of that. What you find is that when the cells are very polarized, certain chromosomes align with respect to the mechanical axis. And when the cells are uh, relaxed, the certain other chromosomes align with the new mechanical axis. So that means that by changing shapes of cells, you're able to rearrange chromosomes. Uh, not only rearrange, you can actually rearrange the mechanical axis of the chromosomes, where they point. So this told us that this has to be, this has to got to do with something with transcription. So we set up high resolution imaging assays to see which chromosomes intermingle more and which chromosomes don't intermingle as you change shapes of cells. So what we found was that when cells are polarized, certain chromosomes intermingle more. And when the cells are relaxed, certain other chromosomes intermingle more. And some chromosomes don't care at all for the shapes of cells. And to our surprise, what we found was that these are the chromosomes that are sensitive to the mechanical axis. When the cells are straight, these are the chromosomes that actually stretch along the mechanical axis. When the cells are relaxed, these are the chromosomes that actually stretch along the mechanical axis. Yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. There's a code that, uh, that's what, yeah. There's a very nice mechanical code of how you organize. Yeah. And so in those intermingled regions, you have all the enrichment of the active PAL2, uh, which are necessary to transcribe genes. So now I showed you one example, which was that when the cells were very polarized, it turned on mostly cell matrix genes, and then the cells were released, relaxed, it turned on cell cycle genes. So we looked at the transcription factors, what they do then. So when the cells are polarized, this 
serum response transcription factors are more nuclear. When the cells are relaxed, they go back to the cytoplasm. Conversely, the cell cycle genetic program is regulated quite a bit by NF kappa B pathways. Uh, so the transcription factor is more cytosolic when the cells are polarized, when the cells are relaxed, these transcription factors go to the nucleus. And interestingly, where they go is to those intermingled regions of the nucleus where the chromosomes intermingle, specific chromosomes intermingle. So we can actually now use super resolution technique to visualize the coupling between transcription factors, fall to foci, and specific genes that come together uh, spatially as a function of the matrix constraint. And as you change matrix constraint, you can actually rewire uh, different parts of the genome coming close or coming far away. Uh, so based on this, we have now set up a new technique uh, to be able to look at those co-clustering directly. You know, one of the major techniques in the field right now is to do this chromosome capture, high C technique that many of you use now. Uh, one of the interest is a very powerful technique. But it's a, it averages out confirmation across the population. So we wanted to test at single cell resolution what are those contacts that you're making. And uh, so as we change shapes of cells, we can on the microfabricated patterns, we can open out the nucleus after cross-linking and look at which genes have come close with respect to these transcription factors. Because we know the transcription factors that are important from the transcription. And uh, interestingly for us, when the cells are more polarized, these gene plus, this is super resolution imaging with the co-clustering of the genes, the green color of the genes. Uh, what you find is they co-cluster and they are decorated with the transcription factors of the serum pathway. But when the cells are relaxed, these clusters are now decorated with the uh, NF kappa B pathway. So that means that changes in shapes of cells have now rewired different parts of the chromosomes, but also rewired different specific groups of genes that have come close or far away uh, that, that we can directly make now. Uh, so now we have a large uh, program now to understand how matrix constraints alter this chromosome rewiring, chromosome uh, reorganization. With a mathematician and statistician at MIT, Caroline Muller, we have a large program in thinking about how to pack chromosomes uh, within the nucleus and how this packing can be optimized based on the transcriptional program and how, when we change shapes of cells, how does the packing rewire in terms of the chromosome position and, as a consequence, how do they rewire the genetic uh, uh, interactions? And I'm happy to talk about this. There's a lot of new data that I'm skipping now. Uh, so until now, what I said was that changes in shapes of cells really alter the transcriptional property. So which means that we should be able to take advantage of it. And can you do an epigenetic erasure? Which means that if I want to reprogram a cell, uh, and already I'm showing you that a, a, a fibroblast cell, which is a connective tissue cell, when I relax them, they're actually turning on all the cell cycle genes, which means that there must be the genes that I could use for thinking about reprogramming. Uh, so I started out with this cartoon from Kahal that changes in shapes of cells somehow took the cell out of the uh, uh, phenotypic characteristic of the cell in the tissue context. Uh, so which means that if I want to reprogram, uh, one of the things that happen, as all of you know, when cells lose contact between neighboring cell or uh, with this matrix, they invariably turn on apoptotic pathway because those cells have been deleted in the body. Because the moment cells uh, lose contact with the matrix, they have cell cycle defects, they have mitotic defects. So cells trigger this uh, apoptotic response. But what we found are conditions where we can bypass that response by this confinement. So I'm going to walk you through this really quickly. So we geometrically confined. So we've figured out configuration which are appropriate for escaping the apoptotic pathway, uh, confined cells, and then let them grow. Let them go through a few cell cycles. Uh, and what you find is they start becoming colonies because they can't attach elsewhere. Because the way we prepare this microfabricated patterns are each cells are 
uh, assembled on the island and they can't attach to neighboring places, so they start forming colonies. And what you find then is uh, the nuclear stiffness, uh, which is well established when the cells are contacting the matrix, the stiffness starts to reduce uh, into becoming a very soft nucleus as the cells start to divide in these confined spaces. And as all of you know, as I said in the beginning, stem cells have their nucleus as the softest one. And as different cell types emerge, the nucleus stiffness increases as a function of uh, differentiation. So as a function of time, we could see nicely that the stiffness changes, the orientation of the nuclear changes, and growth markers. So the cells grow rapidly. As I said, the cell cycle gene cell genetic program is going on. So the maximum in growth pattern, and then uh, it reduces. So, so this is a function of time, yeah, for 10 days, this is, yeah, 10 days. So it means that there is an optimal cell cycle time where there's a maximal rate. Uh, and beyond that, cells are going to go into this uh, quiescent state. So we thought that there must be something with this. Uh, it's like going to a high uh, transcriptional state. And so many of you are familiar with reprogramming. Uh, there have been this notion that when you start reprogramming cells, cells go into a very heterogeneous phase until you funnel them into a particular state. Okay? There's a huge heterogeneity that you build. And so what we wondered was that this phase that you're going into, into this cell cycle phase, must be this heterogeneous phase. So as cells uh, start to divide, what you find is that the, that the nucleus is becoming softer because they lose this nuclear structural proteins, which is lamins. And they're acquiring a number of epigenetic post-translation modifications. Uh, we map a number of them, and I'm not going to go through all the details. And then they start rewiring the heterochromatin organization as a function of time. So we wondered, and then we asked what might be the genetic markers. They throw out all kinds of uh, markers. We start with a mesenchymal cell. The connective tissue is mesenchymal in origin. Uh, you lose the mesenchymal markers. These are transcription factor markers, but you upregulate most of the uh, stem cell markers, uh, most of the cell cell junction markers, and so on and so forth. So, this to us suggested that maybe as you reduce matrix constraints, find the optimal configuration for them to divide rapidly, they're actually going into this heterogeneous phase of turning on all kinds of uh, transcriptional programs, including the stem cell programs. So as you know, cells need in tissues to transdifferentiate local micro niches. That's how they transdifferentiate. Otherwise, they go into apoptotic pathways. So we decided that if these are mesenchymal cells, at the optimal cell cycle time, if you provide a niche like a epithelial niche, can we take the cells and transdifferentiate them uh, without anything? We are only using confinement as a precursor. And so when we provide this uh, uh, micro niche, which is uh, a microfabricated uh, plate that comes to these uh, pattern cells which are growing, you immediately transition into an epithelial sheet. So what you have started out with an, is a mesenchymal cell. And you confine them and you started dividing. So you have an epigenetic erasure of the uh, mesenchymal phenotype. Uh, they forgot that they were missing kind of cells. They were turning on all kinds of genes. The moment you created a niche, uh, like an epithelial niche, they became an epithelial sheet. Uh, so now we know how to transition them into different types. Uh, so I'm just trying to give you an example that you can actually go from a fibroblast to an epithelial-like sheet. And we can confine them further so that you can actually make epithelial niches starting out from a missing kind of marker mesenchymal cell type. And so what we do is we look at uh, promoters and which genes are actually loaded with transcription factors. These are promoter occupancy assays. What we nicely see is that you start out with a mesenchymal cell. And as a function of time, you start losing the mesenchymal markers. But you start acquiring a number of epithelial uh, genes, genetic markers and a number of uh, proliferating genes as a function of uh, time. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I've said so far 
is that shape cell cells are very critical for regulating how the nucleus is organized and how the chromatin uh, accessibility is kept. And alterations of the geometry of cells uh, alters its accessibility to chromatin. I showed you that uh, chromosomes can be reorganized very precisely to bring about specific genetic programs as you change shapes of cells. And there are very uh, uh, you know, interesting regimes of confinement, geometrical confinement, shape confinement that you can actually impose on cells so that you can actually exit from their, uh, from their epigenetic memory state. And you can actually have an epigenetic erasure uh, and transition them by mechanical constraints. So we think that it has imp very important implications. Mm. What we have discussed today is that uh, for us cells are devices and there are modular codes in how you assemble parts of the cell. And the important part for us is that the relative organization of chromosomes uh, with respect to each other are optimized for the transcription factor topology of the network such that uh, for a given cell type there is a co-clustering of chromosomal contacts uh, in which you harbor the specific uh, target gene of that cell type. Yeah, so you know what, what we find, it's a good important question, what we find is that, as you know, only one allele is expressed in a given thing. Usually the homologous chromosomes are actually kept very far, okay, for two important reasons that you don't want uh, translocation happening easily. If the two homologs are very close, they translocate immediately. Mm -hmm. The other reason is that you don't want to co-regulate the same gene multiple times because cells have to tune its stoichiometry concentration of proteins very precisely. Okay, so we start with the center of the nucleus and map out all the where where each of the points are within the system. Okay? And uh, and so when cells receive a signal, they turn on specific transcription factors to feed onto this. But what was missed in this whole argument was this mechanical links to the nucleus. What you have is an elaborate uh, mechanical link through proteinaceous scaffold that connects the nucleus. In fact, importantly, they even sculpt the nuclear shape, volume, size, and so on and so forth, such that when cells see an extracellular signal, what they, either from a neighboring cell or from the matrix, they not only turn on the transcription factor pathway, but they also remodel the site of certain. I showed you one example, there's the same cell in a polarized geometry or an isotropic geometry, actin fibers are going along the length of the cell, whereas actin is actually going in the in the in a, in a vertical in a circular pattern. And that changes in the cytoskeletal link can modulate the container size, you know, modulate genomic contact, which is what we're now showing very elaborately. And cells keep a very precise feedback based on the input signal what you have is the genetic feedback is optimized for the input. When the cells are polarized, only the cell matrix genes are mostly turned on. Uh, as all of you know, cells in the body don't change the transcription too much because once you differentiate them, the only thing they have to do is to remember what transcription they have and remember to cell cycle, uh, you know, cell, cell division. Only when you have an infection or when you have a wound or when you have a pathogen of different kinds, you alter transcription programs dramatically. And so, in a way, cells feedback the genetic space into this mechanical space, such that uh, when you change mechanical space, what you get out is a very precise genetic program through this rewiring. And so, this rewiring is connecting this network space to the physical space. And in order to understand this further, we have this elaborate packing models of chromosomes at different scales, at the scale of uh, uh, small domains with the scales of chromosomes, uh, with the scales of uh, nucleus. I'm happy to discuss those. Uh, it's a very interesting model uh, to think about. And so the implications are, uh, we find this intriguing because now we are mapping all this to tissue environment now because we now have a good handle on how to think about cell shapes 
and how they link up to transcription uh, landscape. So clearly, if you look at these connective tissue cells in the body and all of this, uh, what they go through is they remain quiescent most of the time, but they get activated during this wound healing or pathogen and so on and so forth, and they have to become quiescent. So what I've shown you is we could take the, these fibroblast cells into these spaces, shapes, and we can show which programs turn on, which transcriptional programs don't turn on. And we can already now see when, which state of the cell we can transdifferentiate them. There's a lot of mesenchymal to epithelial transcription that happens in the body. This is very critical for developing programs. Uh, so based on cell geometry and tissue tension and soluble signals, one can now start to build a map of how nuclear reprogramming events happen in the context of this functional uh, event. And we also have a uh, single cell diagnostic platform now because we have a very good readout on what changes in the nucleus at all scales. And that would be a very good readout of uh, pathogenesis. So with that, uh, let me end. it has been a work of a large number of talented colleagues and a number of people who have contributed and a lot of funding from different places. And thank you so much. Okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't know what. <laughs> yeah, I'm so close. <laughs> well, anyway, it's very fascinating, you know, uh, it's a function of the shape. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, wondering about what's the driving force for the clustering yeah. and also the effect of orientation there and uh, also the stress. Yeah, how much the stress? Yeah, so I was just talking to you know, uh, Jerry and uh, Brian and others before. So what you find is that because there are linkages from the cells where they contact to the matrix, through actin and actin-related proteins to the nuclear membrane, and from the nuclear membrane to chromatin, uh, there are physical bridges. We and others have identified a number of important molecules for that physical bridging. So now we can see that if I stretch this room, uh, if we are mechanically connected, we get stretched. Right? And what we find is that not all chromosomes are stretched, as I'm showing you. Right. Uh, there are only specific chromosomes that are necessary for that cell right. type, where the genes are harbored there, for the transcription topology of that cell type. Those are the chromosomes that actually stretch. Right. Okay? And now those chromosomes that stretch, uh, they intermingle with neighboring chromosomes where you have co-clustering of genes. Yeah. And the, the mechanism question... for co-clustering is yeah. that you need a signal, you need a biochemical signal there. What I've done with the mechanical space right. is reorganize all this architecture. But now in those spaces are the places where genes reside. And to activate the genes, as I showed you, you need specific transcription pathways. Uh, let's say serum response pathways for turning on actin related genes. And serum response transcription factors are localized in those regions. I showed you the super resolution imaging with the localization of these transcription factors. So you can imagine that if I want to partner a group of people, I can partner them around, around someone. Okay. And that someone is a transcription factor which will co share multiple genes. Okay. Likewise, when I change the mechanical state of the cell and I form a new mechanical axis to the cell and the nucleus, there are certain other chromosomes that align with this new axis. And those are the chromosomes that have harbor all the target genes of cell cycle genes. And so for that, you need this nf kappa b transcription factors to stitch together, co-cluster the genes. Uh, and we can then open out and visualize them. And now those clusters that we visualize, we can now begin to sequence them. So we can actually have a single cell uh, sequencing of specific regions, direct maps of that again. Yeah. So, so I understand it uh, from a physical point of view. Mm -hmm. They seem to cluster together. Is Plus, there any yeah. uh, basis for that from a nucleation at both? Uh, uh, more than nucleation, what I would say is that uh, those places have very specific epigenetic modifications because you need to turn on regulatory, you need to bring a lot of chromatin remodeling enzymes the RNA pol 2 and the transcription factors which regulate all of them, which recruit all of them. So 
it's like gluing a group of uh, parts of genome and that for the gluing you need this epigenetic mass uh, you need this post translation modification I was wondering. Okay. I was wondering, is is it possible, or can you envision a way to like use a mechanical change in the tissue as a way to force uh, something like a trans di differentiation of the cells as kind of a are, treatment for a disease? Yeah, yeah like which is what we are arguing. You know, the, the reason why Cancer Foundation is funding my lab now. They heard me two years ago in Italy and then they thought that this has got to do with cancer. Now, the thing is that, uh, as you know, uh, cancer starts from a single cell. You know, that's the hypothesis now. Our idea is that a single cell under mechanical constrained condition can actually transform. And what I show the evidence is that if I just purify the cell in culture, I change the mechanical tension. What I change is the plasticity of the chromatin. It's one thing to change it in culture, though. It's another thing to change it I in know, an individual. But what I was just telling him is that what we are seeing as a property in the culture is what you see in the tissue. We are now looking at desocular early embryogenesis, looking at mouse models of uh, hematopoietic differentiation. You find the same signature. Okay? And connective tissue cells and every cells, uh, when you create the right microenvironment, that's the microenvironment that, you know, the idea is to create as much as possible the microenvironment that exists in tissue context. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy for us to go and say some qualitative things in the tissue, but now we have good signatures what to pick up there in the tissue context. So that's what we're now trying to do, to really show that mesenchymal to epithelial transitions like this are precursors in the tissue models for acquiring uh, changes in uh, uh, you know, mutations on the DNA. And, Specific uh, changes in genomic uh, sequence. I don't know the answer at the moment. Yeah, very interesting. That's, that's thing. the direction we are going, and that's the direction we want to go, and that's why we have prepared ourselves to go there. So maybe I can follow up on that a little bit and ask you. Obviously, you started off with the differences in tissue properties, and yet all of these studies are in cultured cells, which is a very different mechanical environment. Mm -hmm. We are able to culture most cell types and they retain their cell type specific gene expression patterns, which, if I understand your hypothesis, shouldn't happen if the mechanical environment would be a primary determinant of that expression uh, pattern. As you know, you know, I talked about the connective tissue cells. The mechanical environment that we create are very similar to what mechanical environment connective tissue cells see in the tissue. It's interesting that you can actually you can emulate them very well. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, follow up. Yeah. There's an enormous body of data, um, basically immunostaining data of tissues, where cells of different shapes show different levels of expression. Have you analyzed that data set to look whether there are any correlations between the cell shapes and their expression levels? You know, we are not done it. As I said, uh, a good starting point is a tissue. Uh, but the problem is, only working on tissues is there's a huge heterogeneity. You'll make some conclusions which are very uh, not robust. What we now have is handles of what to really look there in the tissue now, what futures to look for in the tissue. If we didn't have this, I could have done that and told you that is important, this is important. This has been happening for 50 years, 100 years. I would not know the answer. Uh, well, perhaps taking a very homogeneous example, the early embryo, yeah. which undergoes orders of magnitude changes in cell size, yeah, yeah. yet the cells retain totipotency. Mm -hmm. That seems like an extreme case of a change in cellular mechanic. Yeah, properties. no, but you know, as, as you know, let's say, let's take the example of drosophila in the genesis, right? The moment the cells uh, are formed and gastrulation starts, there's extreme deformation in shape there. Uh, cell size changes, you know, the, the important thing is, let's suppose what we are saying is, if we keep the same neighborhood, you know, people argued that absolute positions of chromosomes are important. 
Okay. But what we are saying is that what is most important is the relative position of the chromosomes. Let's suppose that I can take the cell, I can change isotropically that cell into a larger or a small, I'm not going to change the neighbors with the, with the isotropic tension. This is what we are shown in a separate work that we take the same cell, same shape, but apply isotropic tension or relaxation. That's very different between anisotropic tension and relaxation. Okay, that's important. When I apply anisotropic tension, what I do is change relative stresses. When I do isotropic tension or contraction, it's imagine I shrink the room, then all of us are going to be same neighbors, or I expand the room isotropically. It's a lot more crowded. <laughs> lot more crowded. But then if I change the anisotropy of this. I can then reorganize. Okay, that's that's a critical point actually. Okay. So I have a question. So how you can yeah, although I don't know the answers to all the in vivo systems, okay. So it might be more complicated than I'm, what I'm saying. So how you can uh, uh, see all the chromosomes simultaneously in but in in using slide? No, I didn't you, tell you. you are not seeing the whole we are not seeing system. simultaneously. Okay. We build maps. Okay, these are. Artificial. Of four pairs, we, okay. we can now okay. see four, okay. and now we have a technique uh, which hopefully we should be able to see many more simultaneously. Yeah, yeah technique. Thomas has a technique. Mm -hmm. We have slightly variant technique. Yeah. Yeah. They actually use like aging. Yeah. Like they will aging as well as say obesity, mm -hmm. and that is a result of changing our cells. Mm -hmm. So that means we can. Uh, how, how does it make to again aging and obesity? Yeah. I know. You know, one of the things that happen in aging, as some of you might know very well, is that the laminacy concentration reduces as the, as the cell cycle progresses. And the laminacy concentration is critical for stiffness of the nucleus. Uh, then it's which are, it's in which are a very nice scaling of laminacy levels across tissue. And as you age, as the laminacy concentration goes down, the nucleus becomes highly plastic. This is now known. Okay. Uh, what I don't know is how to link this to aging, uh, and uh, or to her question or to his question. Uh, give us a few years, and we'll come back and then tell you: Are the in vitro signatures how how much is it? But you know, it's a very generic design. I'm talking to you in terms of chromosome organization and. Oh, mechanics also. So just a quick follow-up to that and a question. So the follow-up is that um, um, hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome is uh, mutations in, in laminae, yeah. right? And these are the, the kids that age uh, incredibly, right? So, so there's a direct genetic link. There's too. a direct, well, you know, for progeria, you know, you can actually mimic uh, that by progeria. You know, yeah, exactly. So, so that, but uh, I, I had a question, though. So, so um, this this me mechanotransduction of transcription factor activation is 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 something I haven't thought a lot about before, but um, have recently come into um, um, touch with uh, because of skeletal muscle biology, and, and 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 so these cells respond to physical exercise and they they process glucose differently because of that mechanical yeah. stress, clearly, right? But also they respond to chemical signals like insulin signaling. So have have you thought much about um, what are kind of the evolutionary trade-offs of mechanical versus chemical signaling, and, yeah, and yeah. why cells might adopt one yeah. of those strategies? No, over actually, another? no. So don't get me wrong. You know, when I say mechanical, it's a mechanochemical signaling, because what you have is, in order to transduce signals from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, let's say transcription cofactors like more of major pathways, they're using the mechanical state of the cytoskeleton. If the actin is very polymerized. Then uh, transcription cofactors or serum response pathway are in the cytoplasm because they're they they're, they're in the nucleus because these transcription factors are bound to G actin and when the cells uh, sequester with mechanical tension you favor a factin state which is a stress fiber form and for that you need G actin releasing these transcription factors to the nucleus whereas alternative conversely pathways like NF kappa B actually are sequester on the actin stress fibers as an anchor to be in the cytoplasm. And changes in the actin tension then releases them to the nucleus. 
So in fact, what I'm saying is that it's a mechanochemical signaling. And but the other major project that we have, which I didn't talk about today, is you know, for the same cytokines in the body, the same cell uh, elicit very different genetic responses. And so we wondered why is it the case. So we took uh, in vitro systems like this, put cells in different mechanical states, and added the same cytokine. What we find is a very nice transition in the genetic program depending on the mechanical states of cells for the same cytokine, like TGF beta, TNF alpha, and so on and so forth. So perception of the extracellular chemical signal is very dependent on the mechanical states of cells. Okay. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And this, uh, you know, the in vivo things are always good. We built an institute to think about it as well. <laughs>